Uh, so the 6.5 media team continues its discussions with Microsoft here in the Big Apple. We're talking cybersecurity. We have Sherrod DeGrippo joining us. Hi, Sherrod. How Hi. are you doing? Very well, thank you. So Sherrod, you have responsibility for threat intelligence at Microsoft. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do on a daily basis? Sure, I work with a lot of teams at Microsoft that focus on threat intelligence, which means mm -hmm. understanding what the threat landscape looks like day to day. So they're watching what threat actors do and they're putting that together and reporting on it. So we do things like give attribution to certain countries or crime war groups and say, this group did this at this time. And we take all that intelligence and we give it to our customers. And then we take that intelligence and we put it into the products that Microsoft uses to secure our customers as well. So there's a constant feedback loop between what threat intelligence analysts are seeing and what our detection engineering teams are putting into the products. That makes sense. So, you know, and AI and machine learning are nothing new, but generative AI is new. It's this natural language interface. Um, it's sort of democratizing access, I think, for many years. We thought you know, AI floated in the ether, and now, now it's real. But bad actors are able to leverage this to their advantage, right? So I'm wondering, how are attackers leveraging um, generative AI? And what is Microsoft doing to help sort of flip the polarity and help defenders uh, stay on, on their feet? That's something that a lot of people have been asking, is okay. how are threat actors using AI? Okay. And because we were asked that so frequently, we partnered with OpenAI, as we do for many things, mm -hmm. and we said, hey, let's get together and let's do some real research to understand, uh, from a threat intelligence perspective, what are threat actors doing with AI? And we released that report last month, and it goes through Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, and breaks down what those countries are doing from a threat actor perspective with AI. And what we're finding is that they're leveraging it as an early tool, just like we are. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's something they're exploring, it's something they're interested in, and it's something that they're using to do research and targeting with. And that's exactly as we would expect. And what we're doing from our perspective, Microsoft is fully committed to making sure that we use responsible AI. But what I'm really interested in, I think is really cool, is that we do a lot of AI red teaming, mm -hmm. which means we have teams of people that are constantly trying to break AI and make it do things it's not supposed to. Hallucinate, maybe? Maybe hallucinate, <laughs> maybe, maybe give you information that yeah. you really shouldn't have access to in ways that aren't really safe. They're constantly trying to find those edges so that mm -hmm. they can refine the models and make these tools as safely and as responsibly as we can. Mm -hmm. Something else that I really love that we've done is that we actually have, I think it's the first, we announced it back in October, the first AI bug bounty, which mm. means if you as an individual, as a researcher, find an AI product, a model, an engine that you can make do things it shouldn't do, we'll give you a bug bounty for that. Mm. So we're really focused on making sure the community and researchers are enabled to find problems in our AI products, report those to us, get a little bit of a reward for it, mm -hmm. and then we'll be able to fix those things with a community effort. I love that. So how are you facilitating that, that bug hunt? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the world of bug bounties and security is pretty well established. Okay. But the world of bug bounty for AI is new territory. Sure, yeah. So it's actually very, as you said, democratized. There's a lot of people that can get right into doing AI bug bounties. And when they find something that needs to be fixed in a model or an LLM, mm -hmm. they can send that to us. This is a new frontier for people who haven't done bug bounties before, and people are pretty excited about the possibilities of finding a problem yeah. and then getting a little bit of a reward for it and having it fixed. Getting that recognition. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and this is absolutely fascinating, and it's just one of the reasons, Sherrod, why I'm so excited um, to talk to you today. It's really giving color to something that we've been um, really kind of watching take fold, which is, you sort of alluded to this, right? But attackers have always been very innovative. They've always been evolving their approaches, of course, and generative AI is this new fuel. So I think it really just underscores why threat intelligence and really kind of becoming more proactive and preventative, right, with the security approach is important. So can you maybe talk, you know, across what you've seen, can you maybe talk to where are some of the key areas where you think generative AI might make the biggest impact um, for, I would say, for security teams? 
I think, you know, we're talking today of, you know, the, the star of today is Microsoft Copilot for security. Yeah. And I really think that it has incredible value for the full spectrum of security professionals, mm -hmm. not just junior SOC analysts. Mm -hmm. That's the example we hear because it's most easy to relate to. Yeah. But I think that there's a lot to love for a senior analyst, for a threat and tell focused person, for someone who does reverse engineering, and for someone in an executive role. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the executive use case is actually one of the most interesting because if a CISO needs to brief the board, which they're constantly asked to do, tell mm -hmm. us about our security posture, mm -hmm. that CISO can so easily leverage the security co-pilot to give them what they need at the depth they want. Mm -hmm. So for example, their SOC director may go to the CISO and say, you know, this particular actor is really hammering on our front door. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lot of alerts from them. I'm a little concerned about it. I just wanted to let you know. Mm -hmm. And a CISO who may not have deep knowledge of that particular threat actor can go work with Copilot for Security, learn all about that actor. And, it, and that executive can then say, okay, I, I learned these 20 pages that Microsoft provided me about this actor. Can you condense that into two paragraphs so I can make a board <laughs> deck? So it gives you the information at the depth and length that you want. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think, you know, kind of the flip side to this coin, we've been talking quite a bit about, you know, how threat actors are using this. You've talked a little bit about how security teams um, might use this, but I think we're still sort of in early days when it comes to the rubber hitting the road for customers actually using generative AI, not just in the security space, but in general. So wondering if you can talk a little bit to that. Is that what you're seeing as well? And what should our expectations be when we think about kind of the roadmap to customers really adopting and kind of, you know, getting their feet wet with not just Microsoft Copilot for security, but just generally speaking, generative AI for security? I think that that's something that is fascinating to think about because it is that sort of um, behavioral economics mm -hmm. concept, which is so fascinating. It reminds me of a scene, did you ever see the, the TV show Mad Men? Oh, one of my favorites. <laughs> sure, my so favorites. me as well, I loved Mad Men. <laughs> and um, at one point, um, a, a secretary takes a dust cover off of a typewriter and says, ugh, oh, all this technology. <laughs> it, was, it was this early time where this seemed, to us, we look at it and we're like, a, a typewriter is so primitive. Right. But to them, it was this big advent of something new. And I think that we're in that place with generative AI as well, where we all have to change the way that we think and think about, would this be a place that I could just use AI? Mm -hmm. When you're hitting that sort of frustration point of like, ugh, I'm doing all this, why am I not using the AI tools that are available to me? And I can feel my mindset and thinking modes changing over having access to those tools now I immediately go and say, I need this email polished up a little bit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not super cute. I want it to be nice and impactful and, and communicate in a way that I do. And I bang out something really quick. And then I ask Copilot for Outlook. Sure. I ask Copilot to help me fix that email to be more me, more cool. And I think that you have to think in an almost AI first mindset of before I bog myself down in the agony, is this something I can just have AI do for me? Right, and then clean it up. And then clean it up yeah. and then fix it up. But we've got to train people in the workforce that getting to the AI point should come earlier. Sure. Asking the AI, AI needs to be a first resort, not a last resort. Yeah, very good point. Now you're, you're celebrating or accolading uh, the general availability of Copilot for security. You've been in preview for about a year. So I'm wondering, so from a threat intelligence perspective or a day in the life for a threat analyst, I mean, what, what are you seeing, what value are you seeing these threat you know, analysts leverage in the product? So the things that I've seen is analysts really are able to integrate it into a very quick workflow that then becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. And you can really tell the difference between someone who's been on Copilot for several months and someone who's just kind of feeling their way in the dark with it for the first time. Because you can see that those experienced users are 
doing a, v a wide variety of things. Whereas in the beginning, that user starts with, can it do this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that's what I think of it as. Okay, so I asked it to give me a reputation information on an IP address. Well, that's all I'm gonna use it for. And, th and that's kind of what they do for the first 10 days. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, can I use it for more and more? And they start expanding their understanding and scope of the tool. Mm -hmm. And so then that more advanced behavior is, I'm, I'm having it analyze a script for me in this window. I'm looking over here and I'm having it give me reputation. So the reputation of the IP and the script that it analyzed for me means this. The script did this and the person clicked on that. And it becomes like much more woven into the way they think and the way they mm -hmm. operate. But it's that, it's an interesting sort of, um, like a reverse long tail and then it's this very, very yep. slow start and then it's like a rocket ship up. So once you hit that inflection point, people just, just interweave it into everything they do. So we've talked to some of your other colleagues and the whole notion of the prompt book has come up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that that's helping sort of accelerate kind of the usage that you described there. I mean, can you go into a little more detail about how you're seeing uh, that be affected? Mm -hmm. I think over the history of human time, a blank slate's always scary. It is. Right? A little like, intimidating, right? <laughs> like, it is. here's a canvas, make something of it. Here's a blank wall, turn it into something. I think that's almost a primordial reality of humanity is a big blank thing is both exciting and ugh. Mm -hmm. And so the prompt books give you a little bit of a color within these lines. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a coloring book or a, a paint by numbers that gets you started. And I think while the prompt books are fantastic, generally you can move past those quite quickly and they just sort of become recommendations, which is very important with Copilot, the recommendations. Um, but I love that it's a sort of choose your own adventure with yeah. prompt books yeah. or you can have the blank slate if you feel yeah. like that's where you wanna operate. And usually those that are more mature start going to blank slate because they're ready and they're used to it. You're reminding me of my childhood with these analogies, paint by numbers <laughs> and coloring books and, yep, and, and that yep. sort of thing. But Krista, jump in here. I know you got yeah, some questions for sure. I think, um, I mean, the playbooks, that's a really great example because I was going to ask what Microsoft is doing to help sort of nurture customers along this process. And I imagine the playbooks are a great starting point for that. I mean, to your point, they're certainly not the end all be all. Um, but can you maybe talk to, you know, anything else that Microsoft is doing to help users, you know, kind of along this journey and maybe help to kind of accelerate, you know, that adoption and really open up their minds based on what their particular needs are? I think that this is such an interesting time. Um, you know, the this is a very Dune moment, right? Like mm -hmm. that's in the consciousness right now. And one of the most important pieces of Dune is that a, a beginning is a delicate time, right? Princess Erlan says that to us. And I think that this is similar to that, is that it is a delicate time where we've got to help people help themselves, I guess, is really how it is. It's like when you're a kid's learning to ride a bike and you're just holding the mm -hmm. back of it and then you <laughs> sort of let go. And I think that's a bit magical. And I feel like we're at that place with Copilot. And we see a lot of customers who are interested, they're intrigued, they're curious. And then they're like, I don't need your help anymore, mom. I, I can ride the bike yeah. on my own. And so they go from, we're helping you, we're giving you these prompt books, we're looking at your data and seeing how your data makes sense within Copilot. We're showing you, oh, look at all the threat actor information you can access easily. And then it's sort of, okay, I got this. And I think that's the best way to, for technology to be adopted is for mm -hmm. it to become native. Sure. And I think that we're, we're seeing that with those customers that have been in the preview for a while. Yeah. So do you see a tool like this helping to kind of change the landscape for security professionals, um, you know, maybe in kind of helping to accelerate the transition from a junior to a more senior analyst or even start to kind of change roles and functions so that the security analyst can be even that much more strategic for their organizations, perhaps? I hope that. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's absolutely possible. One of the things that I've, I've worked in security for 20 years now, and one of the things that I've heard the most from my career is, I wish I was better at. Mm. And Security Copilot can become almost a coach as well as that Copilot sit next to you mm. situation. It can kind of guide you. And one of the things that people have always expressed they want to get better at is reverse engineering. Sure. They want to be able to look at code and intuit like a, like a 
psychic what it does <laughs> and that's very wishful and it's right. very sort of like oh if I could just Reason. pull the secrets out of this code yes and many reverse engineers are very talented and they work at it and they work at it and it's it's labor right. mm -hmm. and what I love about script analysis with Copilot is that you just show it that script sure. and it will give you it does this and then it does this here are the functions this is the way it works and so you're changing the way people are able to learn and accelerating that, and you're taking away any of the, I'm afraid to ask, I don't, sure. don't wanna tell the person that I need help. And it changes that so that your confidence goes up. And mm -hmm. I think increasing confidence is something that actually makes education faster and better and more, is that you're confident yeah, to learn. For sure. So Copilot yeah. does a lot of that. Well, and this is a great segue to, to my wanting, you know, to kind of head toward the close of our conversation. And, you know, there's a, there's a huge, massive skills gap in the security industry. Like, I mean, how, how many millions of uh, jobs are not fulfilled, right? Can, can Gen AI, can it help bridge that skills gap? Can it onboard security analysts much more quickly? Can it, can it help sort of level, you know, that, that disparity that's out there in the market right now? I think there's certainly an aspect of that, and I also think that there's an aspect of providing guidance for secure, a security program overall. Mm -hmm. And so it looks at resourcing and it can think about sort of, okay, th this is a high priority problem for you. So reassign resources to this high priority problem or this particular threat seems to be very prominent in your environment. Let's get more people focused on that. So. When you think about a skills gap, for example, it might not be properly assessed in addition to priority. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you don't have these skills, but I actually need these other skills more. Sure. And mm -hmm. I think that Copilot allows some guidance for an environment, for an enterprise to understand this is where you're actually having problems mm -hmm. and these people actually do have this skill. And it can get a little bit bumped up with some co-pilot. So I think that it will maybe not be an easy linear path of, well, you were a junior analyst, you have co-pilot, now you're now a senior you're a analyst. Senior, yeah. It's not a magic pill, right? right? But it is something I think that will allow a view of an organization, a view of where we need help, where we need to prioritize within our security posture mm -hmm. and allow you to better guide that. So it's a decision enhancer, sure. I guess, which I think is, is a really good way to use it. So Sherrod, I'm really glad that, that you're making that point. Um, I never really thought about using generative AI to kind of uncover, you know, where the real needs are and where the real priorities are and then match those to the existing skills that the organization might have. And I think that's a really great comment to maybe kind of start bringing a conversation to a close because I think it does bring us back to the discussion we were having earlier about the um, the threat landscape and how that's always changing and so then in turn of course the needs are going to be evolving from a security perspective um, so before we close anything else you know kind of for you that's top of mind um, that we haven't touched on today that you think would be important for the audience to know I think I'm just really excited about something that as a security practitioner, you know, I've only been with Microsoft a year, so I'm still very new mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things, but I've been in security for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And much of that time, it has been sort of wished for that people could get access to Microsoft's threat intelligence, that vast treasure trove of years and years and years of investigations and intelligence briefings and reputation and atomic indicators and all of these things oh, if we could only get our hands on Microsoft Threat Intelligence. And that's what Copilot really has made real mm -hmm. for a lot of people in threat intelligence roles and in roles where they need to know who is doing what on the threat landscape. They can just ask Copilot and it can tell them. Great. Well, Sherrod, thanks for the time. It's been a great thanks conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much.